If you declare an interest, please note that you're required to leave the meeting prior to consideration of that item. If you could advise at that stage that you're leaving the meeting, and for those participating remotely, you'll be sent an email message advising when you could rejoin the meeting. The meeting is now being recorded and live streamed, and I'll now take the adjournment for this meeting of the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee of the 31st of August 2022. Councillor Allison is participating remotely. Councillor Anderson, um, yes, you're here. Councillor Barker also. Councillor Calicus, um, I see that you're um, attending the meeting. I have apologies from Councillor Chalmers. Councillor Ferguson Miller, I understand that you are substituting for Councillor Chalmers. Could, no, sorry, that's, that's not the case. It's um, Councillor Horsham. Um, you're substituting for Councillor Chalmers, is that correct? Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Anything from Councillor Cooper? I'm not seeing anything from Councillor Cooper. Um, Councillor Dewar, you're at the meeting. Councillor Fagan? Nothing from Councillor Fagan. Um, Councillor Gowland, I see that you're at the meeting, as is Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Keat is participating, as is Councillor Lambie and Councillor Lockhart. Councillor Loudon, I have apologies for. Councillor Mars is at the meeting. And Councillor McAdams, um, I have apologies from Councillor McAdams. Um, I understand that you're substituting for Councillor McAdams. Councillor Confrey, is that correct? Thank you. Um, Councillor McDonald, I see that you're here. Councillor McDougall. Nothing from Councillor McDougall. Councillor McGeever is here. I have apologies from Councillor Nugent. Councillor Razak is at the meeting, as is Councillor Robb. I have apologies um, from Councillor Ross. And I understand that Councillor Ferguson Miller, you are substituting for Councillor Ross. Councillor Salamati is participating at the meeting. Um, Councillor Scott, I have apologies from Councillor Scott. Um, Councillor Brogan, can you confirm that you are here substituting for Councillor Scott? Thank you. Councillor Thompson, I see that you're here. Thank you. I just to let you know I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. And Hi, I'm also here. Sorry. Councillor McDougall, thank you very much for that. Um, thank you. We'll just put you... Yeah, and Councillor Walker. Nothing from Councillor Walker. I don't think I've missed anybody out. Um, there are a number of officers at the meeting. And with that, Chair, I'll pass back to you for the business of today's meeting. Thanks very much, Pauline. Um, we'll move on to agenda item one, which is declarations of interest. Uh, does anyone have any? No, nope, not seeing any uh, interest. So we'll move on to agenda item two, which is the appointment of the deputy chair. Uh, can I invite uh, the committee to propose any nominations? Right, uh, I think Councillor Clark was, uh, if we can go to yourself. Yeah, uh, I'd like to propose uh, Councillor Kirsten Robb as deputy chair. Mm. And oh. Councillor Convery. I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, any other nominations? Uh, with that, then, uh, I think that's it. Yeah, nothing. That, that's nothing online. That, that's that's correct, Chair. If you if there are no other nominations to the the position of deputy chair, then you would want to invite yeah. Councillor yeah. to take her place. Uh, if can congratulate Councillor Rob and invite her to come up and take her place. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Would you like to say a few words? Or? Yeah. 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 That's you. Yeah. Just yeah. the ones. There you, there you go. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your support. Everyone at home as well. Um, if you allow me to say a few words. Um, 
it was a great in 2019 that the, uh, the councillors of all parties decided to um, up the ante on climate change and set up this new committee. And it's good in this term, it's been strengthened as well to have a full committee in its own right. Um, climate change is also a core theme of, in the council plan now, which is great. And it's our collective challenge to turn those words into action. And we must all ensure that sustainability is front and centre of all decision making in the council. And with limited finances, there can't be any more silo thinking. <clears throat> we have to grasp the opportunities. We've talked about the threats, but we also have to grasp the opportunities of climate change. Um, it's already here, but if we're canny and we look for solutions that can deliver multiple benefits on poverty, um, energy efficiency, climate change and so on, and the economy as well, we'll help ensure our constituents save money on their energy bills, address transport poverty, are healthier, happier, and have good green jobs and live in stronger communities. So uh, to do all this, um, Councillor McGeever and I want this new committee to lead, to scrutinise and to challenge. Um, to do all this, we'd like your feedback on any aspects of the last session of the committee and any of your hopes for this session as well. Um, how you think it's, do you feel, uh, how do you feel about it? Any aspects you feel you'd like to understand more about sustainable development? Have you got your head around the key targets? Uh, what we legally have to meet? Um, what help do you feel you need to scrutinise the work of the Council on climate change going forward? We know there's some training in the offing and development, so we'd like to understand more from yourselves about what would help you on this committee uh, scrutinise and challenge and support, but also <coughs> even enjoy it. <laughs> um, so that, that would be great if you could email uh, Mark and I. We've got a busy agenda today, but if you could email Councillor McGeever and I your thoughts, um, that would be great. And we can feed that back on lots of training opportunities. Just a final plug, uh, the Climate Ready Clyde event at the end of September, which uh, Leslie Hinshelwood has already emailed you about, is, looks like a really good event. I've signed up and it will help bring us up to speed about the importance of adaptation as well on climate change and what's happening already across, across the area, things that, uh, that will help support our role. But thank you and look forward to working with you. Thanks very much, Kirsten, and <clears throat> congratulations again. Um, right, with that, if we can move on to uh, items for decision, we've got uh, agenda item number three, the action plan for the third year of the implementation of the Good Food Strategy. Uh, you can find it on pages five to 20 of your packs, and I'd like to invite Elaine Gourichon to speak to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to agree the action plan for the third year of implementation of the Council Good Food Strategy. Section 3 provides some background information on the Good Food Strategy. The strategy was approved in 2019 and the five-year strategy covering the period 2020-2025 and the vision of the strategy is available uh, in paragraph 3.2. The reporting arrangements are outlined uh, uh, in paragraph 3.4. Section 4 uh, uh, of the report uh, provides information on the Good Food Action Plan for 2022-2023 and the action plan of the third year of implementation of the Good Food Strategy is available in Appendix 1. In paragraph uh, 4.2, uh, you will find the list of services involved in the development of the action plan. And paragraph 4.3 gives an overview of the outline of the action plan, which is divided between performance indicators and projects. And then each section uh, is also divided into themes, uh, which are the following. So uh, good, uh, there is good food at home and the community, good food in public places, good food economy, good food growing, good food for the environment, and good food governance. Uh, section 5 uh, of the report provides some information on the food growing strategy action plan for 2022-2023. Uh, so the council uh, has a statutory obligation to develop uh, a food growing strategy uh, and to provide allotments and other food growing opportunities uh, under the Community Empowerment Act 2015. And the Council uh, Food Growing Strategy was published uh, in 2020 with a food growing action plan formulated annually with members uh, of the food growing group. So given the relationship between the food growing strategy and the good food strategy and the requirement to report with, uh, within similar time scales, the good food strategy uh, action plan uh, for 
53 incorporates the main action from the food growing strategy and are indicated uh, in green in appendix one. Uh, section uh, 6 uh, outlines the monitoring framework uh, of the food action plan. So progress uh, of the action plan will be reported to the Climate Change uh, and Sustainability Committee at Q2 and Q4. The improved uh, system will continue to be used uh, to gather the progress from services and to produce monitoring reports. Uh, and a mid-term review of the strategy uh, will also be undertaken from mid-2023 uh, and will be published next year. So then from section 7 to 12, um, you will find the different implications and requirements in terms of assessment. Uh, so no strategic uh, environmental assessment was carried out for this strategy. Uh, the quality impact assessment uh, has been conducted and approved. Uh, in terms of uh, employee implications, so monitoring the implementation of the Good Food Action Plan uh, is a task uh, of the Policy Officer for Food Development, and monitoring the implementation of the Food Growing Action Plan is the role of uh, amenity services. Uh, the implementation of these action plans are the task of uh, resources and services uh, involved uh, in food activities uh, as identified in the plan. Uh, there are no specific financial uh, implications associated with this report. Uh, and finally, it is expected that the food uh, uh, and food-going action plan, uh, by taking into account uh, all the aspects of the food system from farm to fork uh, and encouraging the transition towards a more sustainable food system, will help uh, to achieve the objective uh, of the Council Climate Change and Sustainability Strategy. Uh, finally, I, will refer, uh, you back, uh, I would like to refer you back to the recommendation stated uh, in Section 2, uh, which is to uh, agree the Council Action Plan for the third year of implementation of the Good Food Strategy, which is attached in Appendix 1. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I can uh, open it up to the committee now and ask for any comments or questions. Um, Councillor Clark. and build on the positive and ambitious work of the previous administration in relation to food. But I'd like to ask, how will the newly appointed food champion tie into this? What is the, the scope of their engagement uh, with this action plan and the relationship with communities within this? And also, I notice the, the food pledge is uh, mentioned. Are we able to get more information on that or an update? and how the food champion will tie into this as well and their involvement with that. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, David, would you like to comment? <coughs> Sorry, we're having a problem with your microphone. Sorry, but that's the last members to, to bear with us while we try and sort the technical side out. <laughs> you know, if you wouldn't mind using um, Julie's. Can I move? No. no, we are having... Apologies, we're having difficulties with the microphones this morning. If you just bear with me, please. I'm just wondering, we're getting some feedback in the chamber from uh, one of the microphones at home, so I'm just wondering if I could encourage everyone to um, make sure that they're muted. Thanks. Chair, I'd highlighted to speak, and it's now telling me that I can, if you can hear me. Do you want me to? Um, uh, no. Thanks very much, Alec. Um, we, I've got a wee note here then of you're wanting to speak, but I'm going to go to David first, if that's Yeah, okay. but it's telling me in the computer that I'm currently speaking, Sam. You, you can obviously hear me. You want me to click that to stop it just now? Uh, bear with us we second, Alec. Thank you. Okay. I think we've identified what the problem is. Um, there are members who are participating remotely whose microphones are automatically being activated instead of being activated centrally. So um, we're having too many people asking to speak. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go back to David at the moment um, and we'll come to those members who want to speak. I'll just start to take a note of them. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. If everyone can hear me, um, uh, and, and thank you to Councillor Clark for the question. Oh, right, we're good. 
Uh, the, um, so, uh, as, as members will be aware, the uh, appointment of a food champion was agreed at last Wednesday's Executive Committee. Um, and I suppose the short answer just now is that we're working up an induction uh, programme uh, for the uh, Councillor uh, Gowland, uh, and that will link in to um, the food strategy uh, and the work of the food strategy. Uh, and uh, that will also link into the individual aspects of the role that were agreed last Wednesday. So, so the, the situation as it stands at the moment is we're still working through that, and then we'll engage with Councillor Gowland, Gowland uh, and, uh, and identify through that process the elements of the good food uh, strategy that the Councillor will be able to contribute towards. Thank you. Yes. Oh, hold on a wee second. Sorry, Ross. I could ask those members participating at home, I have a note of those who wish to speak, if I could ask you to switch off your microphones at the moment um, and stop your request to speak and we will come back to you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Yeah. Aye, last time it, auto it came on automatically. I, uh, are we able to get an update on the, the food pledge and what stage of that we're at? I'm trying to find more information. Uh, on it and when we should expect to see more. Thank you. Um, so, so once again, that, that has been developed as well and we, um, we'll, we'll report back on that as soon as it's ready. Councillor, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, if I could just say as well that I've always found that any of the champions that represent the whole council do so tremendously well, and including those from, from um, your own party, whenever I've had occasion to, to seek to engage with them on anything within their remit, they've been absolutely fantastic, and uh, I would very much hope and expect that that will continue with this new role as well. Um, okay, and Just to say, Chair, that um, remotely um, we have Councillor Mars, Alison and Thompson who are looking to speak and in the room we have Councillor Razak. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll activate. So um, Councillor Alison, his microphone has been activated if he wants to speak. Thank you very much. On you go, Alec. Thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, congratulate Councillor Rob on her appointment as Deputy Chair. Uh, the action plan, I think, looks very good. It shows where we are making a significant difference in terms of food waste and food use, etc. But the words both in the action plan and the strategy of using the word sustainable, um, can we get any clear indication as to what you mean by sustainable? Because I think it means a great deal many different things to different people. And on a slightly separate issue, on page 12, uh, it talks about prime agricultural land. Again, can you define that? Because I am not aware that there is 6,000 hectares of what I would call prime agricultural land in South Lanarkshire. Thank you. Thanks for that, Alec. I'll go to David. Oh, okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, so taking the last point in terms of prime uh, agricultural land, I think that's a, a, a planning definition. So um, I, I'd need to come back to you and I'm happy to do that, Councillor Allison, uh, once I check with uh, colleagues from uh, planning. Um, in terms of the, the term sustainable, what, what, what is considered sustainable, um, you're absolutely correct. There are, there are a number of uh, different sort of, uh, definitions and, and usages of that um, in terms of climate, from a climate change perspective, but also in terms of uh, across other walks of life. Uh, in terms of uh, sustainability, in, in the sense that we, we use it here, is what, what we mean by that is that, um, that, that, that the, the thing can, can function more or less off, it, off its own steam and, and on an ongoing basis without uh, uh, depleting uh, resources. But uh, I'm, I'm going to defer in terms of any of my colleagues here if they've got a, a more definitive definition of sustainability in the terms of climate change and sustainability. As you've said, David, in terms of through the, the, the action plan to each time we've mentioned the word sustainable to try and put some sort of definition around it, which we, we, we could do, but it can mean lots of different things depending on how you're. Uh, thank you very much, Alec. Are you wanting to come back in? Or is that okay? Uh, 
Arnold, right? We'll it's move on to Councillor Mars. Councillor Mars. I'll just act. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I was muted externally, Chairman. Um, yeah, that's why I asked the question, because it means so many different things in every different uh, context you use it in, the word sustainable. Um, and it tends to then just become something you say rather than an action plan or an objective. So I think we need to be a lot clearer as to what we mean by sustainable and when. Um, because it doesn't really mean anything in these reports. OK, thanks thank very you. much. Uh, yeah, uh, David's happy to come back in on that. And I just want to say thank you, there, uh, Julia, as well, for, for your patience. Um, that was very helpful of you. Cheers. David. Uh, yeah, fa fa thanks, Councillor Arson. I think that in terms of the report, yes, the, the use of the word susta sustainable is in there. Um, it's, uh, th there is a, a more defined, def you know, definitions below each of the areas of sustainable with individual actions, uh, and I think that's it, that's uh, the, the area to focus in. So we've got individual actions, we've got individual uh, baseline and targets against those uh, those actions. So uh, in that respect, we've tried to unpack. Uh, you know, where, where, where sustainable uh, appears. Uh, I do accept that it is a, a word that is, um, uh, has, been come into, has come into common parlance, um, but the individual actions that sit behind uh, the kind of key areas in the, the, the action plan are, are, are the focus of, of officers. Thank you. Thanks very much. And if I can go now to uh, Councillor Mars. Thank you, Chair. Can I confirm you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Um, I very much welcome the, much of, of this, this report and particularly um, on page 10, I'm pleased to see that, that the increasing the uptake of primary school meal, free, free primary school meal and secondary school meals um, is, is on the action plan. And, and I absolutely would applaud the, the um, work of, of education facilities in, the, in the, the previous administration, bringing in such things as, as parent pay to reduce the stigma for young people to engage with that and taster days, menu consultations, pre-ordering and, and, and huge amount of work um, by schools directly with families to, to encourage the, the take up of that. I am, however, a little concerned to see that the action plan has fairly low baselines, but also details a maintained position going forward. Now, now given the amount of work that's gone on in the past, and I hope that will continue, I would like to see a more aspirational um, target to to increase that take up, but obviously against the the cost of living crisis that that people are facing, as well as our our good food strategy. Um, there's also a further point which it may be helpful to have both my questions um, at this point. Um, my second question is uh, relating to page 13 of of the pack and the detail of increasing the um, the the availability of, of of food waste facilities for for householders. I'm very aware that that last year's budget um, included the free supply of hot composters to those in the rural area that do not benefit from a food waste collection. And that my understanding was that was expected to be um, available and rolled out by late summer 2022. So I would certainly seek a, a, an update of where we are with that. Again, um, the fact that the baseline is to be established um, slightly concerns me and, and a target going forward. I think these are the important things and, and actually how we measure things going forward is 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 as important as, as our actions detailed on the plan. Um, thank you for that, Julia. Before I bring in David, I just want to say this is something that um, a point I'd actually made as well. Um, I, I do agree with you and I think your comments are, are, are certainly you know going to be shared uh, across the chamber there. Um, in terms of, I'd asked some questions about um, the, the school meals uptake and, and I was told that uh, the, the kind of 
they're looking at a period of recovery following uh, the pandemic and to kind of get it to bounce back um, initially at least. Um, I was also assured that there will be a number of um, initiatives undertaken to improve uh, uptake of free school meals. Uh, including the theme days, delicate specials in high schools, uh, and as well as uh, constant engagement with young people and children and uh, development of the menu. Uh, I'm also told there will be cookery skill sessions with pupils uh, to increase their skills uh, uh, and their knowledge of, of school food going forward. Um, hopefully these can all have uh, a, a good uh, um, role in, in improving uh, the overall numbers. Um, I'm not sure if David uh, or the team has anything to add to that. Apologies, all. Can, uh, are people able to hear me at the moment, actually, or did that all go silent? Now? Right, thank you. Um, apologies again. We are obviously experiencing technical difficulties, and uh, we're doing our best, and I do appreciate colleagues' patience with it. Um, I'm going to try and bring in David again. Yep. Th th thank you, Chair. Yes, exactly as you, as you say, Chair. The um, uh, elected members understand that, that over the last few years, in terms of COVID, there have been a, a big downturn in terms of the number of uh, free school meals, the number of children uh, actually engaging with the service and getting school meals. So we're in a, a period of recovery. Um, from that point of view, um, we, we've kept the, the target this year as the baseline um, because we need to try and recover. Uh, and, and then grow uh, that area uh, 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 again over a period of time. Um, and we thought it would be, uh, it wouldn't be wise to put a target in there that we know at this stage that we're not going to achieve. Uh, so, so that's why that's that's down as a baseline. Um, uh, with with the, uh, the grace of the chair, in terms of the uh, the second point, which was a, a food waste composters, and the reason that baseline is to be established is that we're undertaking a review of our waste services at the moment, uh, following the appointment of the new Head of Facilities, Waste and Grounds, who recently joined the Council. Uh, and there's a number of reports that are uh, in development and we're coming forward to a uh, Community and Enterprises Re Committee uh, on taking forward uh, areas such as wood, food waste composters uh, and other aspects across the, the, the waste uh, area. Um, so um, once that, that review is un underway uh, uh, as we speak at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Julia, would you like to come back in? Uh, colleagues, just to let you know, one of the problems appears to be uh, we've got a bit of a glitch where anyone pushing their microphone that they want to speak, instead of just being added to the queue, is actually skipping right to the front. So if I can urge people uh, both at home and here to, to bear with us, we do have uh, a colleague in the chamber at the moment trying to rectify it uh, as we proceed, but I can only apologise for any of the inconvenience it causes, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for your, your efforts. Uh, Julia, would you like to come back in? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I think I, I understand the point where we have um, obviously every resource of, of the council and, and society as general has, has gone through a period of time of massive disruption and, and we're not through it yet. Um, and that, that it can be difficult to, to apply um, apply targets. And I can I understand the reluctance of, of um, fearing to not deliver, but I think these are so important. And actually those two that I've highlighted are not the only situations where the target throughout the papers is actually less than the baseline that's indicated, or there's a, a, a maintained position. And, and as a council, I think we need to be aspirational and drive forward towards all these different very, very important issues. Uh, we seem to have uh, lost, lost you, it. Julia. I apologise for that. Um, We've lost the, the group view on the chair's um, uh, unit. Oh, we've got it back. Thank you. Uh, right. Julia, are you still with us? I'll bring you in again. Right, Julia, your microphone's active if you would like to continue. Sorry about that. I think we may have lost. Do we actually have anyone at home? Oh, there you are. Right. 
Yes, yeah. Thank you, Chair. That, that I don't know whether you heard, um, you know, much of what I said previously, but the, the, in a nutshell, um, I think that we should be aspirational and and apply targets and, and not be fearful to apply targets because we may not achieve them. These are all very important aspects of our work, and and particularly um, when when we we look towards the cost of living crisis that we're facing and how that ties into our our food strategy. So, so I would like to see targets, even though some of them may be very difficult to deliver. I think we absolutely should be aspirational and stretching in our approach. Thank you, Julia. So I actually do share your belief that targets are a good thing when they're ambitious, that they're, they're fairly meaningless if they're not. I do believe that this Council does set ambitious targets and that um, we're going to have to strive to make them. I don't think and meet them. I don't think it will be easy in any resource. Um, I'm wondering if any of our officers would like to speak to the queries. David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Burge. I, I, I don't disagree in principle in terms of the um, we, sh we should be amb as ambitious as, as we can be. Um, from my perspective, it's, that, it's getting that balance right between um, being have asked aspirational, ambitious targets. But remember, this is a, a single sort of year. What's going to happen over the year, and then having that being realistic about the resources that we've got at, the, uh, at our disposal at the moment and also the external kind of factors that influence on it, again, the COVID recovery in this case. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. We, we, we need to be ambitious and try and strive and uh, wear targets. But, uh, again, we need to, where appropriate, to, to balance that. If we know that we where we sit at the moment um, and we're trying to recover back to our position, uh, our baseline position, given uh, we've, 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 the figures have dropped uh, quite dramatically due, due, due to COVID. We need to be, um, there's, for me, there's, there's, there's little merit in putting in an ambition for a year um, if we know right up at the front that, 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 that we're not going to make it, because um, it would just be reporting it as a, as a failure later on. But I, I do accept that we need to be ambitious. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, just before I move on to the next person, we've, um, we're trying to kind of do something of a reset here, and I'm going to invite all colleagues who wish to speak in this portion of the debate to push their request to do so now. Uh, that will allow us to take a list of people that we can then bring in manually should the, the technical difficulties continue. Thank you. So if you could push your request to speak now if you want to speak in this debate. I have uh, Councillor Cooper and Councillor Thompson um, and Councillor Vizak as well in the chamber. Uh, first off, I'm going to go to Councillor Margaret Cooper. Margaret, that's your microphone activated if you'd like to speak now. Thanks. And officers and colleagues, it is my apology for being slightly late for, to the meeting this morning. I get quite an urgent phone call about my father's health and had to deal with that first before I could come on to the meeting. And I had agreed to second the person that was standing for chair. So my apologies uh, for being slightly late and not managing to do that. I hope everything went well. Uh, yeah, it, it did. Councillor Cooper, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your own difficulties this morning. I hope everything's gone well for yourself. Um, Thanks. Would you like to come back in, Margaret? Or um... no, that was all. I just sure thing. Thank you very much, Margaret. Cheers for that. Uh, I'm going to move on to Councillor Bert Thompson. Councillor Thompson, your microphone's activated. If you'd like to speak. Uh, good morning. Can you hear this OK, Chair? Yes. Yeah, we can, Bert. Yeah. Right, thank you. I'll make it brief. Uh, first of all, the allotment scheme, very much welcome. But I'd like to see it as a plans for the future. There can there be plans for enhancement of that scheme and, and uh, to increase it in more areas, more allotments? That's the first one. The second one is, no matter what we do, I think we've got to really make a real effort here with education, get to schools, community groups, etc., community councils, whatever. Tell them we're plan. If it's local councillors visiting officers, whatever, that we must have these people on site. And to get them on site, I think we've got to go out there, uh, you know, and let them know about the thing and how important it is. And the third one, I'll let Councillor Rosak speak his cell, but just to thank him for all his, all his individual efforts, especially recycling schemes that I know uh, that he's visited a few places and he's done a lot of work on it. So thanks to Mo for my cell there. Thanks, Chair. 
Uh, thanks, Bert. Um, yeah, uh, David Bith would like to speak. Thank you, Chair. Yes, in, in, in terms of uh, allotments uh, and, and uh, features uh, further in the report, we've got our, our food growing uh, report. We've got ambitions to extend where we can um, the, allot the, the allotments uh, and availability allotments. Uh, we've got waiting lists in certain areas. Uh, and further on the agenda, there is uh, proposals in terms of uh, increasing the number of allotments in the, in the Hamilton area. So, so in terms of um, for Councillor Thompson, yes, that is, that is an, an, an ambition that we can, will continue uh, to increase the number of allotments and make them available to those who, who wish to take them up. In, in terms of your second uh, point there, which is about uh, engaging with, uh, with schools and with, uh, with community councils and parents, and we do um, already in terms of our, our, particularly our, our climate change and sustainable uh, agenda and uh, our food agenda and, 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 and other subsets to that, and we do engage uh, quite extensively with education uh, resources uh, and with all of the, uh, the departments and the uh, council, as well as with uh, community groups uh, and other interested parties uh, across. So, so it is something that we, we do try. Uh, we are of the, of the view here, and I'm, I'm sure that the, the, I'm, I hope the committee will, will, will accept it, that this is, this is a prevailing view, is that uh, South Lancashire Council in itself cannot uh, take this agenda forward. We need to uh, work in partnership with community groups, with business uh, and with other agencies uh, to collectively take the agenda forward. And we do engage quite heavily across all those areas and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Vizak in the chamber now. OK, thank you. <coughs> Firstly, can I commend the chair for putting the, putting the Good food strategy first on the agenda because I think I think it's vital and uh, really important. Um, the current um, I think Councillor Mar touched on the cost of living and uh, the situation with the cost of living. And on page ten, and I think there's a part of it on page ten is is about the um, food initiatives and it's talking about the healthy start voucher schemes, food bank referrals, and school meals. Uh, I think with families now being pushed because of the cost of food and also with um, the cost of energy um, towards the breadline now and towards the edge, I think we'd, I think there needs to be some some sort of a strategy along with this to to help them because I think that what we just now have is unusual circumstances and because of that, I think the problem is now going to be that the families we normally wouldn't think are struggling will be struggling now and I think there needs to be a kind of a coordinated approach between between all the all the departments now for this. Thank you. Um, thanks for that Mo. Um, as is often the case I find myself agreeing with you um, and uh, I have to say <coughs> I, I recognise that uh, during the last council actually that if the phenomenal efforts that were going to help families uh, as schools were closed down uh, meet the cost of living and I think to be honest the upcoming well the cost of living crisis that we're certainly in at the moment and appears by all accounts to get worse I think will require similar superhuman efforts to be honest um, and, and I know that officers will, will do their, their level best in that and I'm sure they'll be supported in doing so right across the chamber. Um, I'm just wondering if David would you like to come on. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I suppose only just to reiterate what, what, um, what Councillor Rizak and also what you've said, Chair. Yeah, yeah, we we, we do appreciate that you know there's a, an issue and it's an, an evolving and dynamic issue at the moment and seems to be to be changing. Uh, officers, we, we, we're appropriate are, are, are across this and we're trying to put in place whatever strategies that we can to try and support, not just in terms of this particular report, but again across all of the different areas where we engage with uh, our communities. Uh, and I do know that the, uh, the administration and all the parties are, are, are kind of putting a lot of effort into, into this at the moment. Um, some of the things that we can put in place, uh, we can where we can, but sometimes it, it also requires uh, intervention at a national uh, level as well. So, uh, and I'm making available the resources that's required to support those families in the communities that, where they require it. But we're, we're doing all we can, Councillor. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Rosak, and, and to David. Um, the only person I've got remaining I mean, wanting to speak is uh, our Deputy Chair, uh, Councillor Rob. <coughs> Thank you. 
thanks. Um, just to, cover, to pick up Councillor Allison's point about the definition of sustainable development, I googled it there. <laughs> um, so I think the one that's commonly appreciated and used by people is the Brundtland Report one, and that's development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that's a really commonly um, used definition, and I think it's the one that, that the Council mentioned in a few of their strategies as well, but we can go into more on that in the training, and people do use it, use the word sustainable in different ways, but I think we need to come back to the proper definition of it. We don't wreck the planet for our generation or other, other generations, so that's the one to keep in mind. Um, just picking up on the housing um, and the, on the, the food growing uh, question there is to ask maybe if housing could be a bit more involved in next year's action plan. Um, we know there's a huge demand for allotments that uh, community and enterprise are doing a lot to try and uh, develop more allotments. There's reports later on, but um, with so many people still waiting for land to grow, maybe there's an opportunity for housing, um, you know, raised beds, different models um, to look at as well. I know in Perhaps looking at the estates policy, we could we could uh, do a bit more work on that bit, and that might help people in flats that have no access to growing. Um, so, just to, a request to engage housing in that. Yeah, David, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Robbie. Yeah. Uh, we currently do in, in, engage with housing on that, but uh, I, do, I do take on point the, the, the board the point. There's, there's more to do, and we can be more inventive and innovative as we move forward. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much all. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to bring the kind of discussion to an end now and uh, ask that we move the report. Uh, agreed? Second. <coughs> okay. Seconded, yep, yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, with that, thank you very much, colleagues. We'll move on to agenda item number four. Uh, that's the litter strategy for South Lanarkshire. It can be found in pages 21 to 36 of your uh, packs. And I would like to invite Emma Berry to speak. Thanks, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to approve the litter strategy for South Lanarkshire, which will cover the periods 2022 to 2027. The Climate Change and Sustainability Committee approved the development of the council-wide litter strategy on the 10th of February 2021. The strategy sets out a vision for South Lanarkshire and outlines how the council will develop a range of plans and initiatives that will drive the commitment to preventing litter, dog fouling and fly tipping. It builds on a range of existing initiatives as well as complementing a range of national campaigns that we're already engaged with. The development of the litter strategy involved a wide range of consultation engagements and communication across the council with partners and communities to identify opportunities and shared objectives. So the vision of the litter strategy for South Lanarkshire Council is to be a cleaner place to live, work and visit free of litter, fly tipping and dog waste. The strategy will be underpinned by encouraging awareness, behaviour change and personal responsibility working in partnership with all stakeholders, communities and community groups and meeting legislative, legislative requirements for the Code of Practice on Litter and Refuge Scotland 2018. So the strategy has identified three broad themes with 15 further objectives supporting the delivery of the themes and visions which are included within this report. So the three themes are education, engagement and enforcement. So I'm just going to move on to Appendix 1 now, which has the, um, the body of the text, the litter strategy. Um, so why has the Council developed the litter strategy? Well, South Lanarkshire Council has duties under the Environmental Protection Act 1990 under the Code of Practice on Litter and Refuge. There's two duties within Section 89 of the Environmental Protection Act, and that is the responsibilities for organisations in terms of their obligations as far as reasonably practicable for duties one and duties two. So duty one is to ensure that their land or the land that's under their control is kept clear of litter and refuge. And duty two is to ensure the public roads for which the body is responsible for is kept clear. So moving on, who is the litter strategy for? Well, the litter strategy is for everyone. It's for everyone who lives, works and visits South Lanarkshire. And on one hand, it is for the council who are both directly and indirectly involved in the activities and initiatives. It's to provide guidance, to deliver and support prevention and also positive change within the council. But on the other hand, as I said, it's for everyone because everyone can contribute. 
uh, the strategy is a framework of actions for partners, for the communities, for businesses and for residents who wants to keep and see their area clean. The strategy encourages and provides a basis for all stakeholders to develop a litter prevention action plan to emphasise and promote what they're currently doing within their community. So the rest of the body of the strategy goes into focusing on each of these objectives, but I want to go right to the end and really say it's time for everyone to play their part in tackling these issues and work together to bring an end to this ever-grown problem of litter and fly tipping. Through our strategies, vision and objectives covering education, engagement and enforcement, the Council is committed to change. This change will improve our local communities and natural environments, along with promoting collaborative action, as no one organisation can tackle this in isolation. If I can go back to the body of the report at number five for next steps, um, if this is approved, the strategy will go through a design process to introduce infographics and images for ease of reading and to ensure the document is user friendly. We'll continue to work with partners and communities to develop appropriate actions with a focus on working collaboratively to deliver change. And the process on the implementation of the strategy will be reported to the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee on an annual basis. So I would now like to refer back to a uh, point two and ask for um, approval for the South Lanarkshire Litter Strategy 2022 to 2027. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Emma. Um, and if I can just say that I know that this is uh, the, the state of litter, fly tipping and the like, is something that I'm sure every elected member uh, hears about from our ward residents all the time. It is a, a huge concern, uh, and I, I welcome this uh, paper being brought forward. Um, if I can go to Councillor Rizak first. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I was going to say, firstly, that the the issue of littering is not only um, cost, financial cost, but it's also cost to the environment and also to the wildlife as well. My question isn't on, on that side of it. My question is more on the, of the disappointment that there's no mention of the return, deposit return scheme in the litter strategy because <clears throat> deposit return scheme is going to be kicking in August 23. And uh, firstly, there's a lack of information from the Scottish Government and Circularity Scotland about this, this um, Trish Clarkley Scotland is the company created to, to run the scheme. And the second part of this is, is concerns about the council being prepared for this because the bins, the public bins that are placed outside, there'll be an increase in litter because um, if anybody is homeless or looking for, for money, we'll be emptying the bins to look for the cans, the bottles and containers for, they'll have value in it, 20 pence value. And that's been an issue in other countries there is an answer to that, and the answer is that um, you put the bin and you put a shelf above it and you put the deposit return containers on the shelf so that the bins don't get emptied out and there's more litter in the streets. But I've, not, I've yet to see anything from the Council about this and uh, I have real concerns because we've got virtually 11, 11 months left for this. And... Uh, this all needs to be prepared in advance because we're ordering bins just now, public bins, and uh, and uh, there's been no no discussions on this at all. And I think that this could come back to bite us. And then we'll need to do something by retrofitting these bins with with something to stop the littering from from this. And the second part to this is that the deposit return scheme was set up firstly to recycle more but it was also to, to help cut litter bag, which, which has worked in other countries as well. So it is, it is to be lauded, you know, and the, the, there's no issue with the scheme itself, but there is, there is um, going to be um, aspects of it which is going to affect the Council, and I think that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Rizak. Um, just before I bring David in, I was sitting, I'd like to say I was sitting on a meeting um, the other week uh, with representatives of local authorities across Scotland where similar points were made. So I think it's certainly not one that is South Lanarkshire is alone in, in trying to tackle. Um, if it offers you any reassurance at all, one of the things I've spoken to our officers about and, and had really you know, encouraging soundings from them is that they they are very aware in this council of the of the importance of looking at new technologies and looking at ways that can uh, prevent um, litter 
from waste bins and other forms of, of, of public litter bin, um, overspilling onto uh, the adjacent paths and, and, and grassy areas. Um, I understand that some progress in that front was actually made uh, at the Heritage Park in East Kilbride, uh, and it will be looked at elsewhere as well. But, but I certainly take your point. I, th I think you're, you're right that um, nationally there are still questions to be answered about how it's going to run, very important questions, and hopefully we can only hope that those um, will be answered uh, sooner rather Rather than later. If I can just pass on to, to David. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Razit, for that for that question. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, the deposits uh, return scheme is uh, is a, a, an area of business that, uh, that is, is really important to us uh, within the council. Um, it doesn't feature in this particular uh, letter strategy, although it's connected to it. Uh, we don't want the letter strategy to be held up because we're awaiting further information on the deposit scheme. <laughs> Uh, from from the, the Scottish Government in terms of its implementation and the resourcing of it. Um, so that has been moved on to a different business stream. Uh, so we'll tackle that through our recycling. Uh, and then, like all these things, we'll connect it up at the right, right time. So there will be reports uh, coming to subsequent Community Enterprise Resources Committee on the deposit return scheme and how we intend to uh, implement it once we know more information. Thank you very much for that. Um if we can go to Councillor Thompson. Uh, Councillor Thompson, just to let you know your microphone is activated, if you'd like to speak. It jumped out to me was, see the enforcement, that's something that we need. We need a real desire the money and the officers to enforce. I don't think the enforcement's been working so far and we need to really clamp down. I mean, if anyone go at enforcing things, and that would, of course, mean uh, heavier uh, fines, I think. A real deterrent, because just now I think people do not, businesses, etc., and bland tires more confirm. Tire dumping's one of the things everywhere. Uh, we have a lot of problems with vermin, rats, etc. This is all done with litter and people dumping litter. Uh, illegally, so we need to enforce it, and we need to get more money into get more officers out there. And the fines have got to be realistic, because right now I think they're just too light, and people are not, uh, they're, they're not they're not doing what they are. So I think we've got to go out and get these people that are causing the problem. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks very much for that, Councillor Thompson. Um, I think undoubtedly, with all these things, enforcement certainly plays a role. But I think we're we have also got to be conscious that we're looking at societal behavioural change and, and it takes time and, and hopefully we'll get there um, sooner rather than later again. Uh, David, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, you, you, you know, there's a lot of sense of what you say, Councillor Thompson, in terms of um, if we, in terms of enforcement, because that that, that actually sends a really strong signal to, to others that uh, that's seriously. But, but, and, and, and we're, we're working with this in terms of uh, uh, across uh, uh, our colleagues in environmental services and other colleagues across the council as to as to how do we uh, make these enforcements uh, stick. Uh, and it's a, a part of it is about uh, ensuring that you have a uh, sufficient evidence of who has committed um, the crime, so to speak, uh, in order to to actually um, put in place an, an, an enforcement and, a, and, and allow that to, uh, to take place and, and to stand up. Uh, and sometimes that can be difficult uh, in terms of just, uh, you know, if you come across some waste, to actually to linking uh, that waste to an individual or a company. Um, we intend to, um, um, to, to, to again, uh, up the ante in this a wee bit. Uh, and now we've got, if, uh, if the waste, uh, the letter strategy is approved by, by committee, um, as, as the Chair says, Councillor McGeever says, there's a bit about behavioural change as well, but I think enforcement is going to become an increasingly important aspect of that. So it's just to give you some reassurance that it's something that we are working through and how we um, get that evidence base and link people to the actual uh, crime that's been committed and then actually take enforcement action that, uh, that sticks. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, David. Uh, if you can go to Councillor Anderson. Thanks, Chair. So, some of what I was uh, going to raise has just been uh, dealt with there. Uh, but can we ask, is there a baseline figure for the current fixed penalty notices that are, are issued? Because we can monitor whether the 
progress of the increase in the enforcement is actually taking place. And I can also ask, is there going to be any additional financial resources put in to deal with this? Because it is a blight in our communities. And we do have a duty to the folk, the decent folk, who live in South Lanarkshire to make sure it is clean. And we know it is a minority, but they're also the biggest problem, <coughs> certainly I see in East Pride, is landlords appear to be emptying their houses when they get put in new tenants. And they just dump the stuff out in the, the pavements or in the green grass. Uh, so is there anything specific we can do to deal with that aspect of it? Thanks. Thanks very much. We're going to go to David Booth. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Anderson. Um, yes, actually, I, I think that, 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 that's a good idea in terms of putting baseline figures in. gives us something to measure again. So we can, we can look at that and in, incorporate that within, within the action plan. Uh, the, we, we're tackling this with the resources we have available to us at, at, this, at this time, and it may be appropriate that we come back uh, to a future uh, committee to say that um, what what's additional resources might look like in terms of, a, of a, a, a bigger outcome to this. But what we're trying to do is be judicious with the resources we've got that are avail available to us just at the moment um, to try and put in place what we can and, as I say, to make, to, to make these, uh, these areas stick. Uh, in terms of uh, your last point, which was uh, uh, about a, a landlords dumping uh, uh, stuff in uh, as the clear houses, again, we're, we're in, we, we appreciate that as a particular problem that's coming to our attention. Um, we are working with uh, uh, colleagues from Housing and Technical Resources in particular um, and to identify where this happens. And what we're doing is we are trying to get together the right people at that time, including area uh, officer from environmental services, to try and, and identify and link that stuff that's been dumped out of the house to, to individuals. Because this is a difficulty. It's, um, you know, and if a, a, a city and some, you know, wardrobes and stuff like that appear in a street somewhere, um, it's how do you link that back to the person that might have been, and, and, and to such an extent you've got sufficient evidence to take uh, action. Uh, and, and we're looking at areas of, of how we do that um, and through a range of different approaches, including actually um, just going through uh, the, the, the stuff that's been out there to try and see if we can, we can find something that links it to an individual. Um, You'll appreciate when, when I describe it, Matt, it can be quite difficult to try and, and do it. We, we, we do appreciate it as a, a blight, and, and from Earth, we need to take this, what action we can to try and stop that, because um, by it happening, it, it, it means that others see it as being acceptable behaviour to do that. Um, so we, do, we, we are trying as best we can to be across that. Thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, I, do, I do completely share your, your concern about the issue, um, Councillor Anderson. Um, I think. We also recognise that fly tipping in particular is often the work of organised uh, crime, uh, that it's a huge money making business uh, and there's massive efforts across the country to identify those responsible and hold them to account. Um, particularly concerned as well for rural landowners who often uh, end up having to foot the bill and in some cases enormous bills for what is criminal behaviour of others. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, could I go to Councillor Margaret Cooper? Councillor Cooper, just to let you know your mic's active. All right, now, strategies are all very well, um, but there can be just a bland read of what we feel we have to see um, to fit with uh, targets and things we have to meet. Um, to my mind, a strategy needs to have teeth, it needs to have uh, time scales, priorities, and reporting back on it. It needs funding to support it, to deliver the uh, the aims that are within it. Now, I recollect from the last budget that we did uh, last year that we put aside funding, um, reasonably significant funding, uh, to ensure that there was a strategy uh, towards fly tipping. We've had no report back on the use of that funding uh, and any achievements or non-achievements that it has made. Um, I agree with, I want to, uh, I think, um, there's a couple of people have spoken, and I think it's important that the strategy for litter has got to start 
in our schools and in our homes with our young children. That's where it starts. And I don't agree that we can't have a, we need a team out in the ground targeting certain areas and that that's been publicised. Um, for example, if you get to Straven at lunchtime, there's upwards of 150 pupils milling around the town, in and out the shops, buying their rolls and sausage and dropping the paper in the ground. Now, it's quite easy to target a hotspot like that uh, and people soon become aware that, uh, you know, they're being watched. Um, so I think that we've got to start with our schools, we've got to pilot target areas and come down on them. We're struggling badly out here in the rural area with the white van men tipping uh, on a regular basis at the same spots, uh, rubbish coming out of uh, houses that they're working in, uh, walls that are being demolished, etc. These are known areas, and again, we need some surveillance at these areas to actually do something about it, to take police action. One of the worst things that councillors experience is the whole issue of um, dog poo. It's something that comes up in every single election and in every area. Now, whenever, whenever we took a decision to, I know it's a simple matter, but we took a decision to continue to fund free dog poo bags. The, we we, do, we are seem to be continuing to do that to some extent, but we've now got ones that you put your fingers through when you go down to pick up the poo. They're complete rubbish compared to what we had before. So that's, that's not an encouraging position for people that are out in the parks and trying to be responsible. But again, I would hark back to the fact that a lot of it has to start with our children and young people because the young people walk the dogs and they don't want to pick up the poo. Um, older people tend to be a bit more responsible. Um, it's a bit base that, but um, to summarise what I'm saying, yes, I like a strategy, I like the, the way the strategy is written, but I would like it to have long and short term targets, items that are identified to be reported on and that regular reports are brought back to the group uh, on how these targets are performing. Um, and I think that's really important because otherwise you're not going to see any achievement in the particular areas that we're hoping to move forward on. And we're moving back into a budget position very soon. And if we don't have the demonstrative evidence to show that the funding we put into these things makes a difference, then we're unlikely to put more funding into it. Um, so I'll just leave you with that. That's just my thoughts on it. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Cooper. They're uh, valuable thoughts. Certainly, I'll take them on board and I know others will as well. Um, uh, can I see if David Booth would like to comment in response? Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Cooper. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing that you say that I, I disagree with at all, Councillor Cooper. I think the idea of this, this strategy at this particular stage is to, um, you'll see that this strategy is trying to bring all the, the themes, the right themes together in the right way. Following on from that, there will be action plans, a bit like the report that's just gone before it in terms of the food strategy, where we've got year action plans and longer term plans. And against each of those will be individual uh, targets and, and individual services and, and officer posts identified for taking them forward. So the idea of the strategy is, 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 is as I say, it's over the five years is for uh, for um, elected members, if uh, if they see fit to agree that we've we've got the right things together in the right place here, we've now got uh, a, a letter, a strategy officer uh, in place. So the next stage after that would be then to take forward probably to the, uh, either this or the, the next or the, the one after community enterprise committee or this committee an action plan that starts to kind of put that that, that all in place. Thank you. David, I don't think if you don't mind if I come back to you. No, I need um, to I know the grindings of the council and how long it takes for you know things to roll through the process. We're in the middle of, I'm not criticising, I'm merely mentioning we're in the bin, middle of a national bin strike, which is likely to last for a considerable period of time. And our streets are particularly bad at the moment. And whether that's encouraging the fly tipping, I'm unsure of that, but it's certainly upped out in this uh, rural area. Um, I think that we have to prioritise this. It's not something that, that we can push back the action plan, uh, you know, to six months down the road. We need action on this now. 
because now it is a major problem. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm just emphasising that we're having to get time to grind through the, the kind of workings of the council. Uh, uh, the streets need it now and people need to see a demonstrable difference. And we need convinced now that if we put more money in the, in the budget this year, it's actually going to be effective. Yeah, I mean, I just yeah, thanks very much. I'm hearing from David that he would just like to say he agrees with, with you entirely, and I think, to be honest, all of us probably would, Margaret. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a couple of people still wanting to speak in this item. First, I've got here uh, Councillors Clark, Alison and Razak. Um, so I'm going to go to Councillor Clark first. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chair. <coughs> uh, and I echoed the words of the, the importance on, on this issue. Uh, multiple times in the strategy, the Council mentioned that they'll utilise our social media platforms uh, to target you know, education and so on. Will we use paid advertisements on social media in order to reach a larger audience? Is the reach of posts without paid advertisements can be limited, as you might see going through the social media channels and make it free likes or, and so on? Uh, sorry, I've not got my glasses with me, so bear with me. Uh, with this as well, you can target different demographics, you know, 18 to 24, you know, different localities within South Lanarkshire, and it might be particular use to, to young people as well. I can speak from personal experience, being a, a young person myself, having only left school in uh, 2018, it might, be better, it might be a better avenue to engage young people, because I think we need to be kind of careful as well of language. It is an issue in, in schools and so on, and it's, you know, as well as education, also about peer pressure and so on. You're in a group of, group of friends, someone, you know, drops something. You don't want to be seen as, you know, being uncool going away to, out away to a bin. So I think we need to also be careful of language, as I said. You know, we engage with young people rather than, you know, just saying we'll target young people, we'll, you know, get them in trouble if you don't do this. Obviously, you know, that could sometimes need to happen, but we need to engage young people in this, make sure we have a, a positive uh, attitude as well out because it isn't just a young person's problem to target you know different age groups and tailor content to different people in different localities and as well you know outside of social media how do we plan to target different age groups and localities you know out with social media as well as making sure people who are digitally excluded are get aren't disadvantaged and are getting you know a similar type of content and message messaging uh, on this thanks um, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Clark. Um, I wish that I still counted as being a young person, but um, the fact that the light is in here is bouncing off the top of my head really says that I'm not, as does the fact that my primary social media channel is still Facebook. Um, I think you're absolutely right, and we do need a broad, full-spectrum communication strategy to, to go hand-in-hand hand with this from the outset. Um, I'm reassured that, um, that our Head of Communications and, and his team are really focused on this and understand they've got a number of, kind of projects upcoming. Um, I think you're right that we need to be very careful not to scapegoat or in any way a point or a portion blame uh, to particular groups within our communities. Uh, I think young people in particular often get a uh, a harsh time from the rest of us, uh, uh, and in some cases it, it's perhaps wanted, but in the vast majority it's almost certainly not warranted, and we've got to be very careful not to uh, to tar everyone with the, the same brush, to use the, the old-fashioned phrase. Um, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, and uh, we'll certainly be looking forward to that. But I would also welcome, actually, as I think if there's an ambassadorial role in this and an educational role that each and every member can play and that we can all do that ourselves. And I know that some members have an outstanding reach on various social media platforms and, and I think you're one of them. And I would only encourage uh, everyone to, to use every opportunity available to them to set the right example and get the messaging out there that we, we all want to get across. So thank you for that. And when we finish rambling, I'll go to our officers for a more coherent response. Uh, okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to point out that when you mentioned you're still on Facebook, some of us haven't even got onto Facebook yet. But, uh, but, but uh, Councillor Clark's point, point's well made. Take, taking your specific point about uh, about paid media, uh, I, I actually don't know that because it's through our corporate communications that that's so, so. But it's something I can I, I can check out. I'm sure there will be a methodology that they'll use to try and expand the the the, 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 the media. So the, 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 the point is well made just in, in, in terms of, of how do you get this message out and, and for me that's the key thing here because it is there's social media, it's not just social media, there's there's 
there's a range of different methods not everyone uh, uh, follows so social media and I think the, one of the big challenges and we try and, we, we, we try and be upfront about it in this, um, uh, in this strategy is around behavioural change and that's really what, what, what you're saying is that using social media and other platforms as a route to try and change that behaviour. Where we need to get to with we, litter is in the same place um, that we've got to, we, you know, over the years ago about, you know, getting uh, becoming no longer acceptable not to wear a seatbelt or to, to smoke in, uh, you know, in certain areas. So, so it's, it's that scale of challenge, uh, I think, we're litter, and I think it's in, in that about getting people to actually change how they how they think about it. I do think social media does have a huge part to play in that, uh, and we intend. Uh, if this is report is approved by council, is to try and uh, have a, a, a as dynamic a, a, a kind of a, in, you know engagement campaign as we can across all the different social media outlets, including uh, you know not just social media but other outlets as well. And I, I, I pick up on uh, Councillor McGeever's point there that that we all have a part to play with this, including councillors, about uh, wherever we can to discourage uh, littering and, and, and the behaviour. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Alec Allison. Alec. Sorry, if you just bear with us for a wee second, Alec. I've jumped the gun and uh, the technology is just catching up with us. So. Okay, thanks, Alec. You're with us. If you could go ahead. Cheers. Okay, okay thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, I actually agree with a lot of what Councillor Cooper was uh, saying, um, particularly around the rural area. Uh, fly tipping and littering uh, is a crime, and it's the only crime that I'm aware of where the victim has to pay and rectify the situation. And I think that is actually wrong. Um, Fly tipping, uh, we need to enforce, but you can't enforce without identifying. And as uh, David was saying, uh, we do need to identify who is doing the fly tipping in particular. So how are we going to do that? We can't have uh, someone standing on every corner. Um, uh, so how are we going to identify the people and therefore be able to enforce the action? Are we going to employ more cameras, etc.? You've also talked a lot about the litter on our roads and streets, which is great in the urban areas. But when you move out into that rural area, it tends to be thrown over the fence side, whether it be vodka bottles. Um, I stay, I think, the nearest uh, McDonald's is 25 miles away. Yet it's not uncommon. And I'm only mentioning them because they're very identifiable. Uh, they're rubbish lying in the fields. Um, is that going to be tidied up, or once again, is it the victims that are going to have to pay for that? Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks very much, Alec. Um, yeah. Sorry, if you just bear with me, saying. Uh, thanks very much, Alec. Um, I want to um, echo your your thoughts there, actually, and, and your concerns. And uh, within my own ward, we kind of have a incorporates both quite a, a kind of rural area, a suburban area, and um, we recently had a, a case of tens of thousands of pounds worth of clean-up of tyres having been ditched on a, an industrial scale, quite frankly. And I know that this is a problem that's particularly acute in rural communities and that um, farmers and others really do suffer as a, a result. And it, it is unjust that they have to foot the bill. And uh, I think that's something that is going to require... A, you know, broad enforcement uh, at, a, at a level beyond the council, to be honest. I think we're going to have to have a multi-agency approach to that and uh, encourage the police to do what they can. Um, but certainly I would ask David to comment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allison. Um, so, so we're looking at, across a range of uh, different technologies in terms of cameras and, uh, and looking at uh, mobile cameras that we can uh, we can put in a spot. So there'll be, there are certain areas that the officers are aware of where there's uh, um, there's hot spots or repeated fly tipping, uh, and uh, we've been. I don't know if Emma is in a position to come in, but we have been looking at different te technologies around that. I don't know, Emma, do you want to come in, and then I'll answer the the, the next part. So the issue with uh, cameras is to do with, if it's in an urban area, we can use the um, lamppost columns to take power from. And again, they're quite 
easy to set up and also move as well. But when it is in a more rural location, we need to look at more innovative technology that basically uses cloud technology, um, uses small solar panels on the, the cameras to keep them charged. And also instead of recording constant images when there is movement in the area, they take frame shots. So again, enough frames to get a registration plate to basically evidence a vehicle being unloaded. So we're looking into that at the moment because we know that there is these consistent areas in these rural locations that we don't have power going to, that we need to we need to do something to tackle. Um, so at the moment, I'm, I'm investigating that and I've been in talks with North Lanarkshire as well because they've, they're using this technology at the moment and they've been finding it really, really beneficial in terms of um, issuing fixed penalty notices from from these as well. So, um, yeah, hopefully we'll get something like that in soon to, to target these areas. Yeah, on you go. Sorry, so, uh, if, uh, f thank you, Chair, thank you, Emma. Um, Councillor Arsene, the, the, the second point you, you touched on there was in terms of a uh, litter on, on private land and, and, and the so, so the council then has a, you know, it can only act within the auspices of its own a legal framework in terms of a, access in a, areas and other land and also um, within its available resources. So, um, so we're not always in a position to, to enter and, and to, to remove that litter in that a private land, but, a, but we do try and, and remove what, what litter we can, where, where we can within the resources that we have at our disposal. Thanks. Thank you. Alec, you wanting to come back in or are you okay with that? No, I don't think so. We'll leave it at that, Chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Mo Razak and then finish up with Councillor Rob. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, just um, touching on what Councillor Anderson said about <clears throat> landlords, most of the houses rented are unfurnished and uh, Chances are that they were mostly as tenants moving out and they dumped the, 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 the goods outside. Um, going back to the main point was um, about the businesses that are um, fly tipping and uh, they're causing the, the main main thrust of the, the issues. And that's tarmac, house, houses being emptied and everything else, and also with tyres and everything. The problem is that to hire a skip, a 14 yarder is £380. If they can fly tip and get away with it, they're saving themselves £380. And until the fines are heavy enough to deter them, then that, that'll just keep happening. And I think the fines need to be a substantial amount to make sure that that doesn't happen. There needs to be a fear factor. And I think that's the thing that, that these people will understand and fear more than anything else. And... Uh, the other one um, was um, Councillor Allison's point about um, the landowners and the litter. It's always treated as a victimless crime because people that um, throw the rubbish out or dump, you know, the fly tip and everything else on on the side of the land and everything else, it's, uh, people automatically assume that you know the council will take it and that's what the council's there for and everything else. And until that's been changed and the the, the word the message is that it's not victimless, that there's a cost and it's costing it's costing us in resources, then these resources can be put into something else. And until that message is put through, then that still keep happening as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I completely agree. We, this has to be, it is a shameful act and it has to be something that more shame is poured upon those who are involved in it and that I hope would act as a deterrent. Um, uh, I'm wondering if we're going to need legislation at a national level to potentially help with some of this, but, but certainly um, you, your points are very well made. Um, David, would you like to come in on that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Isaac. Yeah, yeah t t t taking each point in turn, in terms of the, 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 the level of fines uh, and, and um, so, so we're restricted in terms of, you know, nationally in terms of the level of fine that we can put in place for these kind of things. It's not something we have uh, autonomy uh, over. Um, and and I, I do also think in, in terms of what you're saying about the um, the cost of this, um, I, I want, and again, as, as we try and change people's behaviours, to try and put as, where we can some figures around that, because I do think 
there is a perception, and it's, it's a shame to say it, that the people think, well, actually, you know, it's the, the council will just sort it, or it's, or somehow it's the council's fault that people are, that you haven't picked up litter quickly enough. The, the fact of the matter is, it's not the council that's doing the littering; it's these individuals, uh, and we need to try and um, just make that as, as, as socially unacceptable as we can through our campaign campaigns that we can, and, and to try and uh, tackle that as well. I, I do, I do take on the points that you raised, councillor. Thank you. Do you want to come back in more? Yeah. Yeah, I need to apologise because I meant to add two more points, but I couldn't read my writing then. So, firstly, um, the, the thing about the, the, the goods that are dumped outside houses, would it not be better if we were to just uplift them, take them away, investigate and find out um, if there's any addresses in, in, that, in that litter, and then invoice them, send them a bill? And the reason for that is that, see, with the investigation and everything else, that lets us lying out there. Then what happens is that they accumulate because more people put stuff on it as well. And when you've got a small, small mound, then it just gets bigger and bigger because the longer it's lying there. So that, that would be my first choice. Um, I don't know leg legally how that would work out. But I think that maybe needs to be um, investigated. And the second thing was about the, the fly tipping, the vehicles and everything else. Maybe we need to speak to the, the government and to, um, ask uh, what they do uh, with untaxed vehicles, where they take them away. Then what part of the punishment is, just take a vehicle off them. Thanks very much, Mo. Um, David? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Rizik, in terms of that, that first point about we, we, we do, we do to, to an extent where we can, uh, we do sometimes go through the, 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 letter, the letter, the fly tipping, to try and identify uh, something that connects that uh, to, the, uh, to, to the culprit. Um, resources, available resources in terms of officers to do that, obviously we can't do that on every, on every occasion. In terms of as we, we try to um, when we move litter, again, the timescales of that are, are often dictated by the resources we have at our disposal, given all the other things that we're going to do. Um, but we do try to get um, to that as quickly as we can. Um, and there's a bit about getting a balance there. Sometimes, um, you, you know, you move it as quickly and then they just, they just fill it up, up again, you know, or they just fly tip again. So, so I do appreciate there's, there's just trying to get that, that right. We do need to try and, um, and again, this strategy tries to do that, is to, is to lay that basis there that we start to take a strategic approach in tackling uh, these. Uh, and, and again, we're looking across a range of areas where um, cre creating potentially uh, targeted teams um, so that uh, officers from waste, along with officers from environmental service, along with officers from housing, will, will, will target an area uh, and will, will you know, target something and actually doing a, an analysis of that litter and, and trying to identify link to uh, a person and then to build a, a case in terms of being able to, uh, to find those people and, and to make that, as I say, stick. Um, so the other point you make there about uh, cars going away, and, uh, I, I, and removing people's vehicles again, that, that would require a, a change in legislation for us to be able to put things like that in place. Thanks very much. Um, we're starting to get a few more requests to uh, speak. Um, I'm going to, uh, I am going to allow them. I, I'm, you know, I'm a big person that believes in it, a, a big believer in um, allowing a, a proper debate to take place. But I'm conscious that we have been on this issue for a wee while now, this item. Um, so if I can, I've got on my screen here, um, councillors Lambie, uh, Mars and Rob looking to speak. So um, if I can uh, finish up after that, thank you. And I'll go to councillor Lambie. Apologies again, it's just taking a wee second. There you go. That's it now. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so just on the fly tipping, um, I mean, it, it really should be a separate strategy, littering and fly tipping. Uh, littering is kind of absent-mindedness, poor education, lack of deterrent. But fly tipping in the majority is uh, effectively an organised criminal activity where people are undertaking commercial activities and then trying to dump their commercial waste in the landscape and the farm, local farmers, uh, local landowners have to uh, 
pay to rectify it. Um, I just wanted the reason that I wanted to speak was really there are some councils in the UK which have managed to half the amount of commercial fly tipping that they suffer, and they did it by using existing powers. Um, so it's powers under SEPA that you're not allowed to carry commercial waste without a license, a SEPA license, and the police are able to seize and crush vehicles under existing powers. So they, they did a campaign publicity where they take some vans that have been caught to dumping car tires or you know car batteries, whatever, um, and then they crush the vehicle and they reduce their fly tipping by half, So it's just a suggestion. Thanks. And thanks very much for that, Councillor. That wasn't actually a power I was aware existed, and it's interesting to note, and I wonder if it's one that we can ask Police Scotland um, about their capability and willingness to, to use said powers. Um, if I can go to uh, Emma for this one for a response. Thanks. Um, so as far as I'm aware, that's an English legislation, and what um, Scottish Government were trying to do was bring that into the, I believe it was a circular economy bill to link basically fly tipping with um, like the vehicles that were involved in it. So that could be the vehicle that was involved. It might not have been the person that was actually doing the fly tipping, but if they are linked to that um, vehicle registration, then it would be them that would be liable. Um, that is something that I believe is still going through the circular economy bill at the moment. And also to link back to the last question, the national litter and fly tipping strategy um, went through consultation earlier in the year and that will be launched by Scottish Government towards the end of the year. So that um, is kind of what we were discussing about the, the, the more national powers. So that could be uh, rise and fixed penalty notices, um, different kinds of legislative powers that go with local authorities compared to Police Scotland or um, or SEPA. So again, that's one. That's a good one to watch for the end of the year, but that will hopefully give us more of an indication what we can do locally from the national strategy. Thank you very much for that, Emma. Um, it's good to know that something's been developed on that at a national level, certainly. And I think if that power should come to pass, then the Council would certainly be uh, seeking it to be used to its fullest extent, wherever appropriate. Um, Right, if I can go to um, Councillor Mars, please. Councillor Mars, that's your microphone active. Sorry for the delay. I've listened to lots of the comments, and I think that... that um, I'm so aware uh, that that whilst lots of this this strategy um, is is welcome, it, it is sadly a, a slow process for behavioural change to take effect, and and that that uh, you know the things that we see in this litter strategy are not dissimilar to the the strategies that you will also see in in a road safety strategy or similar, where where it is a multifactorial um, effect, and and sadly it's a uh, there, most people are 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 um, are well-minded and and behave in a way that we consider appropriate, but a very small proportion of all age groups and in all areas behave in a way that 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 is clearly not, um, and that it comes down to enforcement, education, and and infrastructure, and 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 what what works in one way area for one issue won't necessarily work in in another. Um, going back to to Councillor Razak's comments about about dealing with um, fly tipping, incredibly difficult and, and incredibly difficult because whilst a zero tolerance effect um, in, intention um, is absolutely what we should aspire to, that is very expensive and that can actually encourage um, fly tipping if the council is the 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 last buck and and has to clean it up every time as fast as it appears. Um, what I would suggest is I wonder whether something along the lines of, you know, when, when, when sadly there's an accident, a police aware tape, and I wonder whether a council aware of illegal fly tipping and something along the lines of, if you have information relating to this fly tipping to phone this number may be helpful in terms of identification, because without that, we really only have clean up if we can't identify the perpetrators and obviously work towards a longer term solution. 
Um, thank you very much for that, um, Councillor Mars. Um, David Booth. F thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mars. Yeah, I, 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 the way you, the way you framed it, I actually really like that. I think that's a really good idea. That you know, it's almost uh, uh, you know uh, uh, getting the community to, to work with it, and I, I think that works on two fronts. On one front. Um, it maybe it means that we do get information that, that, that can identify the, the people, but, but actually probably even more importantly what it does is it gets the community and the council on the same side with us is it about, uh, about targeting about the, and that helps us uh, make that behaviour uh, increasingly more unacceptable. So I, I, uh, I think that's something that we might have a, a look at, see what we could do with, if that's okay. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Uh, and I've had a request to speak come in from uh, Councillor Cooper just at the end. I know I'd said I was going to close, but in, in deference to our provost, uh, I'm going to go to Margaret just now. So, uh, Councillor Cooper. We're just going to wait a couple of seconds until the mic goes live. And then after Councillor Cooper, we're going to go to Councillor Rob, and that will be the item coming to a close. So apologies to anyone else who would like to speak. Councillor Cooper, your mic's live. Thank you. It's slightly related and unrelated. Um, we're trying to t clean up our streets and our roadsides, etc. Um, you know, we've talked quite a lot about that, and we've talked about fly tipping. And while David's there, I think it's important to raise that there's a significant amount of I wouldn't call it rubbish, but there's a significant amount of signage and cones and bags of sand and you name it left all over the countryside where we've had road teams out working on the roads. <clears throat> they've put up diversion, they've put up road clothes, they've put up this, that and the next thing. They're, they're very, very frequently they don't come back to take those away. And they get folded up and flung to the side of the road because folk have been uh, been diverted when there's no requirement for a diversion, um, and it do, it does it does contribute to a general untidiness, eh, David. Um, and I think we should. Uh, I would like you to maybe, if you can, emphasise to your teams that there's a requirement on them to lift those signs uh, and those sandbags, etc., and take them away in the back of their lorry when they're finished. You, they forget about ones they've put maybe a mile up the road or half a mile up the road and they end up kicking about the roadsides for months and months uh, and getting run over and then people steal the cones and, and so on. I'm sure you've seen it yourself, but I think it's quite important when, when we're looking at what does our countryside look like and visitors are coming through it and we're keen to keep it clean and tidy. Um, I think it's quite an important matter. Thank you very much. Uh, David, would you like to respond? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cooper. I, I, I suppose there may be occasions where work has started and, and, and then there's a break in the work and then it continues. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. You're talking about it's just left and the work is after the work's completed. So uh, I, I'll, I'll, read, I'll take that point up with the, my head of roads, uh, transportation and fleet, and, uh, and, and we'll look into trying to, um, to tackle that wherever we, we, we find it. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Rob. Thank you. <clears throat> Lots of good questions reflecting the importance of this issue to our communities. I uh, just wanted to finish up by picking up a couple of things, um, talking about behaviour change and the importance of community action. Um, strategies are good, action plans are good, but there's things that we can do right now. September the 17th is World Cleanup Day, and as communities have been heavily involved in these great community litter pickers, and we see the benefits, and it's that bit of peer pressure, bit of um, community action, just a very quick, not very nice example. Um, we had an area of our local street that had about 30 dog poos in a row, uh, and we made little fun signs, me and my son, we, ident we put flags on them and it was, I can name and shame, people actually stopped to take pictures of what we'd done. Um, the council kindly put up a dog waste bin and it's never happened again. So this is just to reflect on the importance of community action. Please get in touch with your local litter picking group. The council support local groups by collecting waste and providing equipment. Get involved with your local groups because it can have a real impact working together as a community to make a difference to our community. Thanks very much, and uh, I'd like to thank members for uh, 
other contributions. It was an extensive item, and uh, it's good to see the, the level of interest um, that's went into it. Um, so, with that bringing the debate to a close, uh, I'd like to move the report. Second. Uh, agreed. Thank you all. Uh, right, with that, if we can move on to uh, items. <laughs> Do you know, I think that's actually a really good idea. So, uh, yeah, if we could have a is 10 minutes, everybody, is that all right? Yeah, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. That's it, 10 to the hour. Thank you very much, all. Cheers. Just check all the mics are muted just in case anyone says anything.
Okay, everyone, um, we're going to resume, and uh, I'm just noting the time. We've spent about an hour and 40 on the first, um, kind of the two items for decision, and uh, it was very good discussions there, and I'm glad to have them, but uh, I think we do have to speed it up a bit. So uh, the remainder of the items are for noting. I'm going to go through the reports, and we're going to hear from the officers. Um, of course, members are, are welcome to speak to them and ask any questions they feel they need to, but if I can ask for brevity, and I promise I'll do likewise and try and hold my tongue as much as possible. Um, so... Uh, with that, if we can go to item five, sustainable development and climate change strategy update. They're on pages 37 to 88 of the packs. Uh, and I'm going to ask Leslie uh, Hinshelwood to speak to it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll take you through this report very quickly. Um, the purpose of the report provides an update on the sustainable development and climate change strategy um, for 21-22 action plan at quarter four. Um, so the strategy that covered the period 2017 to 22 came to an end um, in March 2022. So this report is a final quarterly update of the strategy. Section 3 provides background on the strategy and action plan um, and the action plan is reported using improve um, and a full copy of the report can be found at appendix 1. At the beginning of the appendix, the improved report, you'll find the strategies diagram, which outlines the three themes um, of the previous strategy, sustainable council, sustainable environment and sustainable communities, and along with the strategic outcomes. You'll also find a summary of the relevant sustainable development goals that each of um, the themes contribute to at a local level. Um, the report then provides um, quantitative measures, both performance and contextual, um, and these performance measures highlight progress towards each of the outcomes. The contextual measures, um, although not in the full scope of the Council, um, do provide a health check for that particular area. Um, the next part of the report provides progress on the 21-22 improvement actions towards each of the outcomes. Um, Section 4.2 of my covering report provides a summary of the progress on the quantitative measures um, and you'll see that there are a number of measures um, that will be reported at a later date due to data not being available as yet. Um, these measures um, will be reported along with her New Year's Quarter 2 report um, and officers are, are aware of this. Um, there are two red measures that relate to household waste and recycling, and paragraph um, 4.3 provides an explanation of, of that slippage. Paragraph 4.4 summarises the progress on the improvement actions. Um, the majority were completed or are still on schedule. Um, and those improvement actions um, where they are, the status is green are still ongoing. So we'll continue those um, into our new um, action plan um, for the new strategy. There are 14 amber actions and two red actions. And the table at paragraph 4.6 provides information in relation to these actions and what management action has been taken to address any of the slippages. Paragraph 4.7 provides an overview of some of the highlights for 21-22. Um, and I won't read these, however, just wanted to kind of point out a few key ones. We had the Beat the Street Canvas Lang and Rutherglen claim, which took place and approximately, approximately 60,000 miles were travelled um, sustainably by almost 8,000 people within the first two weeks of that, that project. Um, another um, highlight was the planning committee approved a further 16 sites as local nature reserves and an extension to the existing one at Langlands Moss. Um, the council has been able to further develop its nature restoration programme um, by bringing together its Scottish Government nature restoration funding along with um, the, climate, climate emerge, the council's climate emergency fund. Um, and this programme will focus on improving the biodiversity on various council land sites, including um, for pollinators. 
And another last highlight there is about our Young People's Sustainability Forum, which was established to discuss how young people can lead on aspects of climate change and sustainability within the school curriculum, um, but also how they can influence um, decision making across the council. An offshoot of that forum was the Climate Emergency Newsroom um, that took place during COP26, and young people reported on events and decision making um, to their primary school audience and there was a blog that was um, accessed right across the world. Um, sections 5 to 9 of the covering report outline any implications from the report, but there's nothing really significant there to, to mention. Um, and just if I can refer, um, refer back to uh, section 2 of the covering report, um, and the committee's asked to note the progress made um, at quarter 4 in respect of actions and measures um, within the strategy for 21-22. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't currently have any requests to speak. Would anyone like to do so? Right, uh, Councillor Clark. Yeah, I'll try try and be briefing on the the young person sustainability forum. I'd obviously welcome that, and I think going forward, we need to ensure that we can show that direct action is taken from the, the views of young people. You know, they've said this, and then this has happened. Uh, just to say that going forward, uh, on. Page 63 states that waste education staff during COVID-19 were redeployed to support the operations side of the business. Have they, are we able to give us more information? Have they now started to be reassigned to their original duties? And what's the, the update on that? And then as another question, actually going back now to uh, page 56, uh, I understand you may not be able to give too much inf detailed information on that, the meeting today. But how much is the, the cost of living crisis impacting our progress to reduce uh, fuel poverty? Okay, if I can go to David. Thanks. So, so in, in terms of, of your uh, two questions, your first question, uh, the short answer is yes. Most people are kind of back to their substantive uh, roles now <coughs> as, as we as we try and exit from. Uh, from COVID. In terms of uh, your second point, um, yes, th 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 there is a likelihood that that will, um, that the cost of living will have an impact on on this, but we, we're not in a position at this stage as yet to know what that impact is. Okay, thank you very much. If we can go to Councillor Rob. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, can I check? Newbie question is the quarter two report at will that be presented at the next meeting? Uh, that's the first bit. And the other one is to follow up um, on the youth um, sustainability forum. Um, I believe there was some work done to like take on board their ideas and to find out more. Um, I wondered if that's still meeting that forum and if maybe they would like to present to the climate committee what they would like the council to do, um, so we can hear straight from them themselves. Uh, Leslie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Robb. Um, in terms of um, the Q2 report, that will be brought to the first um, committee following the closure of uh, quarter two. Um, so it really just depends when service and resource plans um, finalise quarter two. If it's not able to come to the November one because of lead-in times, it will definitely be at the February one. Um, in terms of the Youth Forum, yes, that still um, is in existence and the Forum are very keen to have their voice heard um, and would be delighted to come along to the Committee if Committee are happy with, with that. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the final question on this item, Jerry Condry. Chair, it's not a question on this item. Uh, it's a question on other items for noting Chair, the very fact that for noting it's work in progress, could I move that we just endorse all these items? Because if we're going to, if, I mean, councillors get these papers, they should read their papers, and if they've got any to ask on them, fine, they're entitled to ask the question. But why, why have we got officers sitting going through papers that we should have read just for somebody to ask questions when it's items for noting? It's, it's, it's continuing. It's no, it's no, we're not asking for decisions to be made. I'm not trying to stifle debate or anything, but really, 
I would move that we, we, not, we just note all of these unless somebody's got a question in any specific one. Thanks for that, Jerry. I'm sympathetic to the amount of time that's gone on here, and, and I take the point. I think um, colleagues around the chamber seem to be indicating they would want the opportunity to hear and speak on other things, but I think brevity is going to be really important, and maybe in future we'll look at, um, at how we approach it. Um, so, certainly, um, if I can uh, move on then, can I move this uh, paper? Agree the report? Right, moving on to item six, uh, which is Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy 2017 to 22, an achievements report, pages 89 to 98, and I'll invite Leslie Hinchwood to speak again. Leslie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be very quick, uh, quick going through this. Um, the purpose of the report is to highlight some of the key achievements um, over the, um, of the, the, the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Strategy over the last five years. Um, section 3 of the report provides background of the strategy and highlights some of the, the kind of key changes nationally since the development of the strategy, which includes Scotland's um, declaration of a climate emergency and the introduction of new climate change targets, um, including net zero for Scotland by 2045. Um, section 4 of the report outlines themes and objectives of the strategy and highlights some of the key achievements over that period, um, and these are listed under each of the objectives. Just to note that it wasn't possible to list every single action over the last five years of the strategy in the one report, so therefore we've, we've tried to pull out some of the highlights. Um, so this list is not exhaustive. Um, sections 4.3 of the report points out that the strategy and its accompanying annual action plans covered activity relating to all aspects of sustainability and climate change. However, reducing carbon emissions has been one of its central aims, um, and measuring these carbon emissions is central to the strategy's monitoring framework. The Council's own carbon footprint accounts for approximately 2% of South Lanarkshire's area-wide emissions. However, the Council has the ability to influence approximately a third or 33% of South Lanarkshire's area-wide carbon emissions through its plans, its policies, its strategies, its regulatory um, responsibility. So section um, 4.1 Four, figure one provides a graph showing that reduction um, for the area over the period of the strategy. And there's been a 20% reduction um, compared um, with, um, you know, over the five years. And this is comparable with Scotland overall um, for the reduction in the same period. Section five outline, outlines the next steps um, that will include the development of the, the new strategy's five-year action plan. Um, and this strategy will be web-based and the information contained within this um, achievements report will be used to demonstrate the good work that will be achieved that we've achieved to date. Um, sections six to ten outline any implications. Um, and the only one that's probably worth noting is that there are financial implications going forward. Um, many actions within the previous sustainable development and climate change strategy and associated action plans were funded from existing resource budgets. However, going forward, there will be a need for more investment in order to meet challenging targets and timescales. Um, we will also have to do work with Scottish Government and UK Government and external partners to seek funding to support delivery on larger um, net zero projects. In addition, the Council has a legislative requirement to report to the Scottish Government on how they are allocating resources to align with carbon emission reductions. Um, so that's really just for, for noting. And if I can revert back to section two of the covering report, um, the committee is asked to note um, the achievements from the strategy over the last five years. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Leslie. Um, we've got a couple of requests to speak here from councillors Cooper, Mars and Rob, and uh, I'd like to keep it to that, please. So, councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper, on you go. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I want to support Councillor Convery's proposal. It's not uncommon in other committees that we gather together 
the items for yeah. noting and move them in a body. Um, and uh, Con Councillor Convery is quite correct. As responsible councillors, we should have read all of these reports for noting. Um, we're, we're sitting here and we've got officers reading out to us what we should have already read. I suggest if you're not willing to gather the items together, that you move each report without asking the officer to report on it and ask for questions because you know it's it's, it's repetitive we, we right. read these papers and we've got an okay. officer i, I take the point councillor cooper thank you for that I, I do take the point um i'm keen to let people speak wherever they feel they need to speak but i'm conscious that time is running on um i'm minded do, is there any objections to that approach that that we would move the rest of the items on block and allow members to ask questions about any of them in one go. Is there any objections around the room? No. Okay. Um, then I propose that that's what we're going to do in the interest of brevity. And apologies to officers for um, for their time and effort that's gone into this today. Um, okay. So with that, we have requests to uh, speak from councillors Mars, Rob, and Lockhart. Uh, and I'm going to ask, so I'm going to, uh, I think um, the sensible way to approach this would be to say uh, that I'm going to invite questions about this item first and then move the remaining items on block. So if that's okay. So are there any items, anyone wishing to speak at the moment on this item? Councillor Mars. Again, sorry, we're waiting for the technology to catch up. Councillor Mars, on you go. Thank you, thank you. That what, what I would say first of all, um, and whilst I completely understand that that time is precious, both of officers and and members, it, this is an absolutely critical committee that we are sitting in, and the importance of fully understanding and being able to ask questions is is paramount. So whilst I understand that that we need to not uh, go over and over points and um, and and perhaps uh, where the answers already in the papers, but if it's not immediately obvious, obvious or greater information is needed, I very very much value the opportunity to ask questions and scrutinise what we're doing and how we can do things better. Um, so the two points that I wanted to, to raise is that on page 91 of the pack, um, that it notes that 63 council um, buildings have PV panels. Um, whilst I, I welcome that um, as, as um, completely green um, energy, um, I'm wondering what, uh, what going forward um, is the intention to expand that, given that against the, the current and future electricity cost, um, the investment cost for such technology has massively reduced in recent years and, and, and actually could be very beneficial. Also, I'm interested um, to ask what percentage of our electricity that we buy in is from completely green sources? Is this something that, that, that uh, a large proportion or all of it already is? If not, again, for householders, and I realise householders are not the same as a, a local authority, it's a fairly easy thing to do and something we should be aspiring towards. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go to Stephen Turner on this one. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, oh, thanks, Chair. Sorry. Um, regarding the, the PV panels, um, as you'd probably see through my report, which is in um, Agenda 8, um, the Council has installed and been quite ambitious in the past in installing um, PV panels on a number of properties as part of our SEAF funding. Um, now, where from the emissions side of things in there, 10 years ago, when electricity was an extremely dirty source of electricity, you got larger benefits from installing solar because it offset the carbon emissions. Whereas now, as the, uh, the GB grid currently um, decarbonises, you get less carbon savings for the same level of PV install. So you're correct in, in what you say in there about PV, but it's only one part of the equation. In order to meet the zero um, heat strategy going forward, we need to eliminate all fossil fuel. That's where um, PV is one part. 
what is the electricity grid decarbonises between now and 2035, the grid takes care of itself. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be investing in PV and we've carried out some feasibility studies to see where we can add to existing properties within our portfolio and to extend properties that are already there because in the past, potentially, a PV system was sized based on um, connections to the grid. Now, um, again, within the paper that I was going to present within there is that the expectations are in the next 10 years, the, the, the grid is going to have to be twice as large in central Scotland as it's going to be to be able to take the two-way supply, both of electricity being generated, but also from the, the systems that are generating to be able to take back in and balance. So we have looked and we have a feasibility at the moment regarding PV installs. Um, your second question in there about green sources. The Procurement Scotland framework, where the Council um, procures its, um, its electricity contract, is actually via EDF. Now, if you look to EDF's breakdown on the, on the back of the bills in there, they are probably the only nuclear generator um, for, for UK. So if you looked at the back of their bill, they're probably the greenest tariff that you would probably obtain from one of these normal suppliers because of the makeup. However, when it comes to emissions reporting, we can't report on um, zero emissions because we go and buy a green tariff or a green labelled tariff out there. We need to use the, the emissions factors that are dictated by the um, UK government when it comes to emissions reporting. So we could go out tomorrow, like a lot of private sector companies will do, and they'll go out and they'll buy a green badge tariff and they'll say our electricity is free or is, is, is green, no, um, no emissions are contributed from there. As a local authority, we don't have that luxury, unfortunately. Thank you very much for that. Um, can I ask Councillor Lockhart to come in? Am I alive? Yes, you're, yes, you're very much alive. We're glad to see you. Please keep Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a sort of broader brush question, but obviously with recent events and the unbelievable escalation in all the prices and costs, if you like, for <laughs> energy supply, and um, frankly the fact that the real pain is going to be felt, felt by far the most by the poorest paid uh, in our society, I just want to uh, ask a question: Is 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 um, <clears throat> looking forward? Obviously, the recent elections look like throwing up a um, a new prime minister who is going to address one of the causes of these increases, which is the, the what you call it the green levy or the climate change levy, which is apparently worth about 180 pounds to every household, which is being if you like, put on top of bills by the electricity providers. Now, if the UK is doing that, is that UK-wide, I want to know, or is this something that is going to be left to the Scottish providers under Scottish control? And to some extent, this knocks on to a second question, which is that Scotland, probably mainly to be different, has said that it wants to be um, zero carbon by 2045, as opposed to the UK, which is 2050. Now, uh, this is already adding pressure to bills. I want to know exactly where, if you like, we stand in the council and together with the Scottish providers with regard to this green levy. Because I really do worry that it's all very well having high-flown ideas by people who've got money, wealth, position and control, you know, having a great theory. But is this realistic in view of the massive increases that we're now seeing in energy costs? Thank you very much for that. I'm going to bring in David Booth. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lockhart. In terms of that, that first point about the, uh, the, kind of the, the, the levy on households, I understand that's UK wide, but I would, I would in all honesty need to go and check. Uh, it's not something that, that um, we deal with at this particular forum. Um, 
and in terms of the um, you know the, the level in general as a societal general, I, I suppose in terms that becomes a, a, an issue for the um, you know not for individual councils or individual resources within councils, but um, for a, at a national level, there needs to be a position established on that. So I think that would be one that that we wouldn't be in a position to be able to answer. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Rob. Uh, a quick one, uh, 5.3 It's talked about a transitional uh, plan for 2022 to 2023, just to ask when that would be presented, um, hopefully next committee, because that will be halfway through 2022. Thank you. Uh, sorry, is it Stephen? Oh, sorry about that, Leslie, you're out of my view line here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Rob. Um, it, it, it goes back to the, the, the same um, answer about when quarter two finishes. So if it's not at the November one, it will definitely, an update on our interim plan will be presented at uh, the February one. So it'll be after quarter two closes, because we, we present at quarter two and quarter four. Councillor Mars, I'm sorry, I'm wondering if I missed you, if you were due to come back in, uh, if you were looking to. So I'll do that now. With, with your indulgence, Chair, that, that would be helpful. Um, thank you to, to the officer for, for, um, for the information about PV. And I do understand that's just one aspect um, of, of, um, of the energy um, requirement of, of the council and how we can meet that. Um, I do wonder whether further detail on where we are with that, where we're going, and, and how we can maximise that, and also in relation to to the other measures that we can be using against our buildings, um, you know, so in a similar way to householders have an EPC and, and are able to look at a range of options to maximise the heat efficiency and the the um, the the way that they generate in, um, energy. Um, I would also ask specifically, and, and perhaps it's something that could be brought to a future committee rather than take a lot of time today, um, that something that's notably absent from the, the action plan going forward is any mention of green hydrogen and whether that is something that um, may be useful in some of our areas going forward. Uh, thank you very much. David, do you want to come in? Stephen Turner is going to come in. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, Councillor Mars. Sorry, um, regarding the PVE generation, we actually generate just now from our PV systems over 1 million kilowatt hours or units per year mm -hmm. from, from our sites within there. There is, as I say, greater potential you know, to, to actually do that. The, the big focus, though, um, now is a lot of the, the low hanging fruit has been tackled over the last 10, 15 years, and you'll see through um, you know, the, the paper agenda eight some of the measures that have been carried out. <coughs> You know, such as improving um, efficiencies through BEM systems, boiler replacements, PV panel installs, um, various types of technology that have been looked at to reduce <coughs> and make the smaller changes. We're now at a stage now where we need to make the huge changes that are highlighted within the report. Between now and 2038, we have to remove all fossil fuel heating systems for all our non-domestic properties. Huge exercise to do in just 16 years' time. It equates to 290 of our non-domestic council buildings. We have to decarbonise if, in fact, these buildings are actually being retained. And through the report, you'll see within there in the, in the table, and I'm sorry for, for going over um, things in here that councillors perhaps have already read, but you see that over 52% of our non-domestic emissions are from our education estate. You know, it's, the, these, are, these are major, major pieces of work that have to be carried out to decarbonisation. I agree, small measures and a lot of small measures together can make some sort of difference, but the sheer scale that we are looking at is we need to be removing emissions at a rate of this entire building and an example of Blantyre Leisure Centre every single year now for the next 16 years. That is the scale of, of what we're talking about. So I do understand, you know, the importance of these small measures and a lot of small measures can can, can make some con contribution, but we're way beyond that now. We need to have that ambition now um, to meet the 2038 target to be zero emissions. 38,000 tonnes per year attributed to our non-domestic buildings. That's not going to be resolved by putting PV panels throughout the council. That's about wholesale radical review and removal, replacement of our fossil fuel systems. 
Sorry if I went off track there, Chair. Well, thank you for that. Um, right, fine. I'm going to ask if we can conclude this with Councillor. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I can, can see that Leslie would like to speak to that as well. Sorry about that. Thanks, Chair. And, it, and it's just to add to what, what Stephen is saying, the, 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 the scale of this, bearing in mind that our carbon emissions and our own carbon footprint from our own estate is only 2% of what South Lanarkshire <coughs> carbon emissions are. So we have a role to play in reducing their carbon emissions right across South Lanarkshire and working with partners to reduce that. So what, what Stephen's talking about in the scale of that is only 2% of what we need to do right across um, South Lanarkshire as a, as a whole and then, and then Scotland as a whole. Um, we do have a lot of scope to influence change um, in that we, we've got about 33% that we can, we can influence. It's just to kind of point out that that scale that he's talking about is small compared to what we still need to do right across South Lanarkshire. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I understand uh, Councillor Horsham was looking to speak. I'm afraid you've been knocked out of the queue, but I'll put you back in there. There you go. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm, it's, not, it's not really on this item, and while I respect um, what my colleague Councillor Convery and Councillor Cooper have said, I would rather the papers did get, um, we did go through the papers. The reason behind that is this is a climate change and, and sustainability committee. We're trying to get people to buy in to what we're trying to do and take the lead as a council. And this is a public meeting where people can see what we're doing. They have not got the papers in front of them, you know, so they can't see what's for noting and everything. So I would prefer, in my opinion, that we continue going through the papers, if that's OK, Chair. Right, uh, Councillor Anderson. Thanks, Chair. Just when Stephen mentioned the buildings that we have and a lot of it was education, the high schools we don't own, these are PPP owned. Do those companies not have a duty to decarbonise those buildings without building it to the council? Because I can tell you now, any work that gets done in these buildings is very, very expensive. So I'm just wondering, do they not have a duty to decarbonise the buildings without building it to the council? Thanks. Yeah, sorry, on you go, David. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Chair. So, so in terms of the PPP uh, buildings, the PPP contractor is obliged to meet any legislative requirements of the of the contract. The problem with this in decarbonisation, if that legislation is no, is saying that you've got to decarbonise by a certain period of time. If that period of time is beyond the end of the PPP contract, then the PPP contractor is not obliged to to have completed that before that period of time. Um, so. Uh, ultimately, these buildings, once the, the term of the PPP contract completes, will revert back to council ownership. And I, I'm, I think there's understand that the, well, in fact, as I know, the, the date of for decarbonisation is beyond that period of time. So I'm afraid that probably is something that would sit on the council's sh cost sheet. Thank you very much for that. Um, can we agree the report? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Right, OK, I've listened to what everyone said and I'm very conscious there's a bit of a tension here between moving through in an expedited manner and giving due scrutiny. The last thing I want to do is prevent opposition councillors in particular from you know, doing their role, and I'm very conscious of that, having served in opposition for five years. Uh, what I propose to do uh, as a compromise, and I will be keeping an eye on the clock throughout it, I, I think we're, we're going to have to, I'm conscious there's another committee following us in this chamber, uh, is I'm not going to ask the officers to read out the remainder of the reports. However, I'm going to invite questions individually from each one so that members can, who are, and I presume members have read their papers anyway, uh, and will be able to, to ask questions without being, um, you know, having the, the benefit of them being read. Out. But I do apologise if, if that does mean that members of the public, I don't imagine we've got a huge viewership at home, but if members of the public are maybe left wondering, um, I would direct them to the website where they can also see the agenda papers. Um, so with that, if I can move on to item uh, 7, pages 99 to 122. Um, I'm not going to invite Julie Richmond to speak, so apologies for that, Julie, but I'm going to invite members uh, to ask any questions or make any comments they would wish to do so now. I'm 
I'm not seeing any hands raised. With that, can we agree the report? Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item eight, carbon emissions, non-domestic buildings, pages one, two, three to one, two, eight of uh, our papers. Uh, again, apologies to Stephen Turner. I'm not going to invite him to speak to it, but I will invite uh, any members who wish to make comment or ask any questions to raise their hands now. Uh, Councillor Rob. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe in a future committee could ask for a, a report about how sustainability is incorporated into the design of new builds because we've, we've seen the, from the report that the nurseries have been built with gas boilers in just 16 years we'll have to retrofit those nurseries so just a bit more information about how to make sure that any new builds from now go carbon neutral. Thank you. And David, yep. So. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Rob. Yes, um, as we look at new properties now uh, and in, through the design stage, we're looking at their carbon rings. So I'm happy to bring a report or ask my colleagues on housing and technical resources to bring a report to the next committee to explain how we're going through that process. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can we agree the report? Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item nine, the good food strategy update for quarter four, pages 129 to 170. Uh, apologies to Elaine Grishon, I'm not going to invite you to speak to it, but again, uh, I will invite members to uh, make any points or questions uh, if they'd like to do so now. Okay, we have nothing on our screen here, so I'm going to ask if we can agree the report. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item 10, food growing annual report for 21-22, pages 171 to 180. Uh, again, apologies to Joe Gillies, I'm not going to invite you to speak. Uh, would any members like to make comment or ask a question? I'm just going to pause for a minute to make sure that the members uh, dialing in remotely have opportunity as well. There's nothing coming through, so can we agree the report? Thank you very much. Item 11, food growing sites for the Hamilton area, pages 181 to 186. Apologies again to Joe. Uh, can I ask any members who wish to speak or ask questions to do so now? Uh, first up, we've got Councillor Rob. It's not so much point about the particular site, but it's just about the process. Having observed um, one of the previous allotment sites, I think it might be beneficial to have pre-application discussions with the community, to, because there sometimes can be a bit of controversy. So I think uh, pre-application discussions, explanations about the legal duty from the council to make allotments, why it's important that this site is considered, and that'll help develop a bit of dialogue and address any concerns right at the start. So that's just from absorb, I haven't absorb, um, observed the process and been a little bit involved, I think it'd be important to try and develop a, a constructive dialogue at the early stage about new allotment sites. <clears throat> uh, David Bith. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Rob. Yeah, I, I, I do think that um, the more that we can do to engage with our local communities as we go forward and, uh, and bring them along with us uh, is something that I would encourage and I'll ask officers to, to consider that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I have no further <coughs> requests to speak on this item, so can we agree the report? Uh, finally now, uh, item 12, single-use item reductions, uh, a report pages 187 to 190. Apologies, Julie, uh, for uh, not asking you to speak to it. Um, would any members wish to speak? Councillor Clark. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'll try and uh, be brief on uh, page 188. It talks about uh, single-use PPE. And I imagine that now that it's still reducing the amount that we're purchasing. I assume I'm right in, in, in saying that. Uh, and are you able to give us much information how much it's reducing, you know, this year in the amount that we're that that we're purchasing? Uh, yep. On you go, sorry. Yeah, as I say, so far what we've done with the PPE is we've just established a baseline. So we'll most certainly we, we tend to look at it a year at a time. Um so we would generally be look, waiting to the end of the financial year before running our reports to, to make a comparison, but that's certainly something that we're keeping our eye on and that we propose to come back to a committee with, with information on. 
Thanks for that, Julie. Uh, Councillor Vizak. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm um, on page it's, um, item 4.2 and the use of plastic and now moving on to wooden knives and forks and uh, cups. But it might, might not be wiser to um, just give the councillors and staff reusable cups and also look at um, get instead of stirrers and everything else, just get metal spoons and then they can be washed and reused. I think it's going back to the old days when I think the older generation knew how to recycle and we didn't and we thought we knew better. Uh, yeah. Julie, would you like to come in? I guess how we're trying to tackle that is to try and encourage people to bring their own with them rather than actually provide them for people. Um, we did look at using um, metal cutlery in schools. Um, that wasn't particularly successful because the, the cutlery all ended up in the bin along with, with everything else. Um, so I guess in our, our, as our services recover from COVID and are um, getting back to more normal usage, we'll certainly be looking at all sorts of ways to further reduce that because we want to, we want to get them down as close to zero as possible. So we will certainly take that on board and, and refer that back to, to the catering um, service as a suggestion. Want to come back supplementary, please? Back. Yep. Um, have you um, resolved the issue with um, uh, families with disabilities that um, they require a plastic straw instead of the paper one because a paper one turns to mush when it's been left in? <coughs> I know there's a plant-based straws that are out that are a lot stiffer and a bit easier to use and don't go go to mush. Um, have, have you had a look at all that? Really. Yeah, your mic's live. Yeah, we did the same thing within our uh, service users, within um, social social work, that type of thing. So, yeah, we've still got the ability to, to purchase um, disposable plastic straws for those that need them, uh, where the, the, the paper ones are not appropriate, yeah. There is. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, the question I asked, I apologise if, if I wasn't clear enough. There is plant-based um, technology now that you can actually get straws that are um, not paper but they're plant based and they're very good because they keep the shape a lot longer so it might be something to look at. Okay I'll certainly I'll look into that and see what, what straws they are actually got on the procurement catalogue but we could we could tackle that through making that available on the <coughs> procurement catalogue. Thanks very much Julie and thanks Councillor Rosak. I have no further requests to speak on this item so can I uh, can we agree the report? Thank you very much. Uh, members and officers alike would be delighted to hear that I have no urgent business uh, has been intimated uh, and therefore I thank you all for your attendance, for your patience and for your assistance and I promise to expedite things a bit next time. Thank you very much all.